Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Sebastian Malaby, who is a uh, senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, also the author of, wow, a number of books. Um, I have a couple of them with me here that I read back in the day, this one, including this one, The World's Banker, all about the World Bank and Jim Wolfenson. Uh, and, uh, and this one, More Money Than God, which is kind of a, it's a history of the hedge fund industry. And, of course, most recently, this book called uh, The Power Law, Venture Capital, and the Making of the New Future. Welcome, Sebastian. Great to be with you, Greg. So this book, I mean, you said that it had two purposes. One was to explain venture capital, and then the other is to kind of evaluate it, right, and see if it is a net contributor to the world. Um, and I guess I want to start off by asking you about the explanation piece, because, you know, I studied finance right, for many years and taught finance for many years on, on the East Coast, right? And so I was steeped in, you know, all of the quantitative methods, right, and all the valuation techniques that are used by you know, buy side analysts and by, you know, private equity groups or LBO groups as they were caused, called back in the day. And, you know, we would focus on EBITDA and, you know, uh, if we were pricing a, a derivative, you know, we had these complex mathematical models. And then when I came out to California and I got more familiar with venture capital, I, I realized that almost none of that was useful. <laughs> In, the, in this industry, and it's it's not even clear whether or not venture capital is a you know dom belongs in the domain of finance from, from an academic perspective. I mean, obviously, it is about provisioning companies with with money, but you know the the techniques and the methods they they seem to be really a mix of finance psychology, strategy, network theory, <laughs> you know, organizational dynamics. I mean, it, it, it seems like it's, it's barely finance. I mean, I think that comes across in, in the book that it, it is this something which is kind of at least as much art as science. I mean, I, I don't know whether that's, I should probably shouldn't use that language, but, but that's kind of the message. I mean, is is that, is that a fair description? Yeah. I mean, I, actually call it finance without finance. Uh, that's one of the chapter titles in my book. Uh, and it's precisely for the reason that you say, you know, the first thing you would learn if you study traditional finance would be, you know, discount the cash flow uh, to figure out the value, think about the price ratio to the, the ratio to the book value uh, and all that stuff. And you, you obviously can't do um, price to book when there's no book value because you've just got... Uh, two individuals who walk into your office saying they want to do a startup and it's their dream and they tell you a story and they don't actually have any assets to contribute to book value. They just have this idea. Um, and the same thing with earnings, of course. There's not going to be any earnings for a while. So this is finance without any of the traditional financial tools that give you quantitative benchmarks, um, you know, advising you whether to do the investment or not. And it's, it's just sort of like judging the future, um, judging the individuals who say they're going to build that future, uh, judging their embeddedness, as you said, that I think network theory is part of it because part of the success will come from whether these individuals have the standing in their communities to hire the early engineers who will take a bet on their company and get stock options, which will be worth zero if it doesn't work. So credibility, storytelling, embeddedness in the network, the sense of vision, the sense of passion and commitment from the founding team. These are what the VCs are looking for. Well, and, and another point that you make is that economists like to sort things into markets and firms, right, a la Ronald Coase. But in order to understand venture, you have to understand this kind of more fluid structure, right, sometimes called networks. But it's really about the fluid, right, movement of ideas and, and of people uh, across these, these entities, right? Yeah. 
I mean, as you say, uh, the classic Ronald Coase um, distinction, uh, the two big institutions that make capitalism work, um, as he explained to us, where you have markets with price signals and the price signals help to allocate resources. Or you can have firms where there's top-down direction by strategic managers who coordinate uh, resources in that fashion. Um, and my argument about venture capital is it's kind of a hybrid where you do have this strategic top-down direction of resources because you have venture capitalists who operate a bit like the directors of the you know, strategic innovation department of a big corporation. You know, they have a budget of money, i.e. their fund, and they allocate that between different applied science projects, i.e. different startups, and they're, they're taking a strategic view. But then the, the round that they provide in the investment that money, that runway, will run out in nine months or something. And then the startup needs to go out into the marketplace to find the next tranche of capital, and there will be price discovery. And if nobody hits the bid, uh, the business will go out, you know, the, the startup will fail. Um, and so it's this mixture of price signals and top-down direction, which I think is a, you know, grown to the point now where we ought to acknowledge that there is this third pillar of how capitalism works, namely venture capital-backed startups. Yeah, and I think you, you said that it was uh, my colleague Annalie Saxenian that really began to describe how this works. And, and of course, you know, she was trained as a, a sociologist, not as an economist. Exactly, yes. I, I owe a lot to her writings. She wrote this um, famous book, uh, called Regional Advantage, I think it was published in the early 90s. And it compared Route 128 uh, around Boston and the technology ecosystem that used to exist there and Silicon Valley. And, you know, the mystery that she was trying to explain was how come Route 128, Route 128 had been ahead uh, right up until around 1980. And then in the 1980s, uh, Silicon Valley just, you know, speeded into the lead. And her argument is that you know, Silicon Valley is more porous in terms of its industrial sociology, that, you know, ideas and people can move out of one company into another company very easily because there's this high circulation of the, the staff, you know, keep on jumping jobs, uh, startups rise, fall, get merged into each other. Uh, when they fail, all the people go off and work for some other startup. So the porousness of the institutions means that ideas don't get bottled up in one organizational structure. And then if those ideas don't yield a good result, the ideas are dead. Um, where, you know, whereas that is the problem in the more hierarchical uh, Route 128 structure where you had more secretive, vertically integrated companies. And if some engineer halfway up the ladder had a great idea for a new product, uh, but that product was threatening the existing product line of the company, um, then maybe the head of the research department would say, we're not doing that because it's going to cannibalize our own thing. And then that idea would just die. Uh, whereas in the Silicon Valley model, that engineer would have quit and gone off and you know the idea would not be wasted. And what, what I'm trying to add to that great analysis by Annalise Saxenian is to say, okay, which is the professional tribe that is most incentivized to make this circulation of ideas and money and people um, really operate in a healthy, productive fashion? And my argument is that it's the venture capitalists who are you know, paid, basically, to get up in the morning and have breakfast with one person uh, and then have 14 cups of coffee with different people, hopefully decaffeinated before they go to bed, uh, because they're always out there meeting the next five engineers that might be hired by the company that they backed last month, meeting the next 10 entrepreneurs that they might want to back, uh, meeting the, uh, the entrepreneur they backed three years ago and who's now thinking about the exit or something's going wrong or whatever. It, it's a network business. And I met plenty of VCs, and I tell these stories in my book, who really made it their mission to be super connectors. Um, and they worked hard at it, and they would go have lunch with people, and at the end of each lunch they would say, tell me who the two smartest people are that you know in the valley. And then they would go see those two people uh, and they would grow their networks in this way, maintain the network by sending little updates to those people that they've met already. You know, here's a professional, a scientific article that you might find relevant. Oh, I was speaking last week to so-and-so, they asked how you were doing. So keeping it fresh, uh, 
keeping the connections alive. And that's how, when the right opportunity arises and a new startup gets formed, you know who to call um, to slot into that new startup to make it successful. Well, I think one of the main points of your book is that if you want to understand venture capital, you can't think of it as like a stock picking exercise, right? The most successful venture capitalists are not the ones who are, are simply able to identify uh, good prospects, whether they be good founders or, you know, good businesses. I mean, certainly there's a big part of it is being able to identify those things, but that in venture capital by its nature is, is, is active, right? The money comes with, with advice <laughs> and the, the, and governance, right? And if, and if it doesn't come with advice or, or governance, then it's not going to benefit either the investor or the, the, the startup. And, you know, I was teaching corporate finance for, for many years and, and um, this is a big theme in my corporate finance class, which is, you know, debt comes with different kind of advice and and uh, governance than, than equity, and, and private equity comes with different advice and governance than than public equity. And and so the story you tell is sort of how this notion of active investing by venture capitalists kind of runs in cycles, right? And um, we sort of neglect that piece at, at our peril, right? And so when you talk about the rise of what you might call dumb money, right, that, that led to all sorts of, of problems. Um, so, I mean, do people fail to understand that component when they're trying to make sense of venture capital? Yeah, and sometimes the venture capitalists themselves forget that component. And, and this is where I'm critical of the uh, industry. Um, you know, my big picture view is that it's a good thing for the United States. It's a good thing for innovation. Um, and I think that the people who lead the Series A, Series B sort of early stage investments, they do go on the board. Uh, they do pay attention. They are activists. They do provide governance, and that's as it should be, and it, that's a great strength. Um, but I think where it can go wrong is that in the growth stages, when we're talking about Series C, Series D, and beyond, and uh, the investor's writing a much bigger check, and probably the company's already a unicorn, i.e. worth a billion dollars uh, or more in terms of market cap. Um, at that point, the tradition has arisen um, that the investor is much less hands-on. The investor basically writes the check and says, I don't need a board seat. I don't need to second-guess what you, Mr. Founder, are doing. In fact, you're a genius because you've started this company and it's already a unicorn, so you know, more power to you. I'm just going to stand back and watch. And that is, that is not governance. And then on top of that, often the Series C investor says, and if you would like to have super voting shares, Mr. Uh, founder, um, be my guest. You can have, you know, 10 votes for every share that you own, and I'll take one vote for every share that I own. Uh, and that's anti-governance. That's the opposite of oversight, right? Uh, and I think that this is why you get these stories like uh, WeWork, where the founder goes off the rails, Uber, where the founder goes off the rails. And of course, it's those ones uh, which Netflix then will make a movie about, uh, which is not really good for the reputation of the ecosystem. Now, look, you began the story with um, Arthur Rock, right, and the the early days of what we now know of as kind of venture capital, but you could have begun the story much earlier. I mean, you could have talked about Ferdinand and Isabella, you know, <laughs> in, investing with, with Columbus, right? You could have, you know, started with the the whale ships, right, and the syndicates that were put together to finance them. So, you know, what exactly is it that was new about what we think of now as, as venture capital. I mean, people have always been investing in, in startups and prospects and funding new businesses. So, so what exactly was new about the stuff that you describe in this book? That's a great question. I mean, you're right that risky ventures, um, for example, sea voyages or whaling expeditions uh, in New England, were indeed financed rather like modern venture capital. There was kind of a two and twenty structure where, um, you know, the the sea captain um, would uh, take capital 
uh, from the uh, financial backer and uh, pay them a return uh, where, you know, um, they get the profits, but the sea captain keeps 2% of the money to manage the ship and put the expedition together and then keeps 20% of the upside if the ship voyage makes a profit. Uh, and so to this extent, it's not entirely new. I think what was new when Arthur Rock showed up in 1957 on the West Coast and financed Fairchild Semiconductor was the application of this 2 and 20 kind of model um, to, you know, an onshore company, and specifically an onshore company that was going to do technology, where the upside, um, where it was kind of as risky as a whaling expedition, uh, and the upside was as big as, as that too. And of course, back in the day, in the 19th century, you know, whaling uh, generated um, the fuel uh, for making lamps work. And pre-electricity, that was a pretty big business. And so it did have a kind of central role in the economy. The upside was very big if you could do a successful whaling expedition. And the equivalent of whale oil for illuminating people's houses uh, by 1957 was to turn out to be semiconductors, uh, you know, the most sort of exciting technology, which was about to, as we later discovered, you know, double in power uh, every uh, couple of years. And I think, so what's, what's new is the application of that 2 and 20 to this new uh, area of uh, semiconductor powered innovation. Well, what's amazing is all the features of the modern venture capital back startup, these things had to be discovered, right? There was a bit of tinkering. So for instance, um, you know, American Research and Development, one of the early funders, this was publicly traded, right? And so they had to realize that, you know, limited partner is going to work better. There were other uh, efforts where they would find the opportunity first and then go raise the money, right? And they realized it's better to raise the money first and then to go find it. And then the whole idea of, you know, paying employees with options, right? This was also something which kind of wasn't there at the beginning. So there were a bunch of these sort of experiments before they unlocked the combination of features, which seems to be the recipe for success. Right. I would just add one other early experiment, which I think was misguided, and that was the use of debt. Um, mm. When the government decided it wanted to encourage startups it created this small business development program and essentially the government provided debt to funds which raised some equity. Uh, it also provided a bunch of strings which had attached to that um, debt, which hampered the ability of the investors to do well. But, but fundamentally, if you're running a venture fund, you want to back growth companies which will use capital to grow. You don't want to saddle that growth company with an obligation to service debt and pay you money on a monthly or annual basis. Um, it just doesn't make sense to provide debt uh, if you're focused on growth. Um, and so I think that was another blind alley that the, that the industry went down in the 60s. And it was really around the early 70s when Sequoia and Kleiner Perkins were both founded as 1972, where the playbook really begins to emerge, where it's pure equity. The equity isn't a fund. It's not a listed vehicle on the stock market, just like you said. Um, you go on the board because this is an illiquid investment. You cannot sell it to get out. So you manage your downside. Since you can't sell, you go on the board and you're an activist and you try to prevent catastrophe by offering advice to the entrepreneur. And finally, you issue the financing in tranches. Um, and that is quite a subtle idea. I think more than we, we take it for granted now that there's a Series A, Series B and all that. But actually, it was a clever idea because not only did it reduce the risk for the investor to only give a certain amount of limited money at the beginning uh, until the startup proves that it can take the biggest risks off the table. And then you give them some more. So it reduces the risk, obviously, for the investor. But also, it is much better for the startup founder because the startup founder, when issuing stock right at the beginning, you know, at the beginning, you've just got a vague idea. It's not worth all that much. So you're going to take a lot of dilution of your ownership just to raise, you know, a million bucks or something. If you wait, if you raise a one million and then you just use that to get the biggest risk off the table, now you've got something more valuable and you can raise the next million whilst giving away much less equity. So the founder keeps more control and the investor reduces the risk. Uh, and that was, I think, the, the last 
kind of core innovation that made venture really work. Right. You talked about how some of the early founders were obsessed with this idea of, you know, eliminating the, the white hot risk, right, in the early stages of, of their investments, right, and separating out the, the technical risk from, from the business risk. That's right. And so this came up uh, with Genentech, uh, which Kleiner Perkins backed in the 1970s. Originally, the founders came to Kleiner Perkins and said, OK, we want to use this recombinant DNA uh, technology. We're going to build artificial uh, insulin. It's going to be a great business. But to build the artificial insulin, we need and then they named some very large number. And it was the idea of Tom Perkins, uh, as in the co-founder of Kleiner Perkins, uh, to say, well, that's a lot of money. I'm going to give you a much more limited check at the beginning. And you're going to prove to me that the, the most sort of obvious technical threats to this business can be, you can prove to me that you're going to get over the first couple of hurdles. And then I'll give you some more money. It'll be better for you and better for me. Uh, and so that was the one of the origins of that um, stage-by-stage uh, financing. The other one I tell a story about relates to Sequoia, uh, where you had Atari, a very different kind of enterprise, this you know kind of grandfather of uh, video games, and there the problem was not so much technical, because building video games was not technically all that challenging, but it was commercial because the question was could you sell these things, and um, uh, Don Valentine, the founder of Sequoia, wanted to invest, but it was a kind of crazy. Uh, disorganization man culture where you know the founder of Atari would sort of wander around have you know notes on pieces of paper that fell out of his pocket as he proceeded around the office hold his board meetings in a hot tub with cans of beer floating around in, in the hot tub it was you know chaotic in terms of the accounting so Don Valentine was kind of scared to put a lot of money in at the beginning but he put a bit and then he kind of helped them to write a business plan and land a proper customer. And then he invested a lot. Uh, so again, he was de-risking himself by going in in tranches. Now, I also teach a course on, on behavioral finance. And I remember when I f- first started teaching that class, I used to think that kinds of bubbles that we saw in financial markets were, were limited to public markets. But um, of course, we've seen that that's, that's not true. Um, but, you know, when it comes to um, deciding where to invest, there does seem to be an element of looking around and seeing what other people are doing, right? So at the end of the book, you you cited this um, experiment around, you know, generating musical hits, right? And and, and it it showed that um, in alternative environments, different songs will turn out to be the hits, right? And, And the key thing is, you know, do you get early traction? And if you get early traction, so we all know about how winner take all markets work for product but but it seems like there's also kind of a, a feedback loop when it comes to investing I, I, I had someone speak in my class recently I was teaching a class on on crypto and uh, he said you know venture capital is behavioral investing in the disguise of fundamental investing now I think that's a bit of an exaggeration but but there's all, there's an element of that right so you describe these stories where investors were very wary. And then as soon as they found out that their colleagues were investing, their competitors were investing, then all of a sudden, you know, they flipped and and became interested. So, uh, you know, to what extent is that an an integral part of of the process? And, but to what extent can you have kind of too much of that? Well, I'm going to take two uh, cuts at this question, because it's a very interesting one. So the, the first one is about the bubbles point that you began with. And I often joke that if you wanted to invent an ecosystem for generating bubbles, you would insist that all of the investors should have their offices on the same road. We will call it (laughs) Sand Hill Road just for for an example. And we'll say that there should only be one hotel with a good restaurant on that road. We'll call it the Rosewood. And we'll say that they're all going to hang out at that bar at that hotel uh, and have their meetings there and sort of, you know, basically exist in this little bubble. And then they'll all think the same thing and you'll generate bubbles. And it's kind of true. And it's also true that you can't go short in venture capital. Unlike in hedge funds, you can't, you can't express the view that something is way overvalued because there's no way of being a short seller. You can't even express like verbally the view uh, that something is overvalued because if you were to do that, you would be excommunicated from that rosewood clique 
uh, because you would be bad mouthing other people's deals, um, and uh, and that's not popular. And if you want to be syndicated into the Series B from some colleague of yours at another venture firm, you better be nice to the other Series A investments he's doing right now, even if you think some of them are nonsense. So um, this is a system for inflating bubbles, and that's why there are always going to be ups and downs in the cycle in venture capital. And that's an element of how the behavioral dynamics work, but it's not the only one. I think, and this is sort of the second part of my answer, I think behavioral dynamics are super interesting when you think about the question of whether solo venture capitalists, uh, whether that's a good model. It became fashionable uh, in the last three, four, five years. Um, I think partly as a function of the bull market um, leading up to 2021 because it was relatively easy to raise capital. And if you had some decent claim to be embedded in the Silicon Valley ecosystem, you could go out as an individual and raise some money. And why not do it by yourself? Um, but I think that when you're trying to make slippery judgments on early stage ventures, which have no quantitative uh, guidelines, as I began by saying, you, you kind of, all you've got is the ability to test your human judgment on a smart partner who will push back against you and say if, if, if they disagree. So I think the dynamics within venture companies, like that Monday morning meeting when you decide what to invest in, you've got six or seven partners around the table, that's super important. And when those dynamics are well managed, for example, when you don't have anchoring, to use a term from um, you know behavioral science, i.e. when... I'm not just providing an opinion because two minutes ago I heard you say something in favor of this deal. So I want to be kind of close to where you are because I don't really know what I think because it's such a subjective judgment. If you can avoid that anchoring, everybody goes home on the weekend, reads the investment memo, makes up his or her mind, comes in on Monday morning and is willing to express that view and, and, and support it with an argument. That's when you get, you know, better group dynamics, better you know, you, you arrive at a better investment decision. Uh, and I think it's when you don't have that sort of partnership that you get what you referred to, Greg, where, you know, some VC doesn't want to do an investment, then hears that some other person that they respect has done it. So then they suddenly want to mm -hmm. sprint into that deal as fast as they can. Uh, and this is sort of, you know, social proof. And it shows that you don't really have your own conviction. Right. Well, of course, uh, the VCs have to pick companies to invest in, but the LPs have to pick GPs to invest in. And, and it seems there's there's a little bit of that kind of um, feedback loop happening there as well, right? So the, the successful VCs are find it easier to raise money uh, than the, the unsuccessful ones, or the old ones and established ones find it easier to to, to find LPs than, than new ones. Um, and so that means also that if they've done deals in the past, it, they find it easier to get access to deal flow, right, in the future. So th does this lead to sort of, you know, persistence, right, you know, market power? Um, I mean, you, you tell the story of Kleiner Perkins, which sort of seems to refute that, right? But, but there does seem to be some persistence, right? There is, that's right. And for exactly the reasons that you say that, you know, number one, if I've done a good deal last year, which might have just been completely lucky, uh, I now have a halo uh, around my head and other entrepreneurs who would like to have an endorsement from somebody who's perceived to be smart uh, will come and see me. And so I get better deal flow. And as you say, also, I can turn around to the LPs and raise capital uh, in larger quantities uh, and spend less of my time doing it. Presumably, if I spend less of my time out on the road trying to raise money from LPs, I get to spend more time uh, focusing on sourcing deals, and I'll do better at that. Um, so there are those dynamics. What's interesting, though, is I think they're not dispositive. You know, I almost didn't write the book because I thought, well, if it's just path dependency, um, you know, initial luck in year one followed by path dependency, then there's no real skill and there's no real alpha, and it's just not interesting. Um, and it was only when I sort of made my third or fourth trip out to the Valley to interview people that I began to see, you know, what the skill was. And I began to see that that path dependency does exist, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not determining all of the outcome. 
And I do tell that story about Kleiner Perkins going from hero to zero uh, in the 2000s. You know, in 2001, it was the most successful venture partnership in the whole world. And by 2011, 10 years later, it was not even in the top 10. Um, so it proves that path dependency is not uh, going to be a guarantee of success. And indeed, there is some academic literature that tries to quantify path dependency. And it's something like, you know, if you make a good investment uh, in one year, your odds of your investment in the next year or the year after um, being a 10x is is kind of it's increased, but it's increased by kind of a couple of percent or something. I think I forget exactly the number, but it's not it's not as huge as one might suspect. Well, speaking of skill, I mean, you talk a lot about you give specific examples of where VCs have kind of helped to redirect the the startups that they're funding, and and sometimes they they do this by removing the founder, right, and shaking up the entire governance of the startup. Other times it's through it's through carefully worded advice, right, and and coaching. Um, it, so, is how does um I mean, sometimes you can think about you know exit versus voice, right? Exit's not really an option, so you have to express your voice. Uh, but there's two ways to do that, and and one is you know through removal, and one is through through coaching. I was wondering if you could walk through a couple of of those examples. Um, the, the example of Uber is, is particularly interesting because the, the founder had control of the voting shares and yet still wound up agreeing to be ousted. Yeah. Um, so the canonical example of um, removing the founders uh, from the kind of earlier history is Cisco, um, where you had this uh, husband and wife team who had come up with this multi-protocol router, basically the first router that, that you know, didn't just work on one intranet, but could start to connect up different kinds of intranet uh, and basically create the internet. Um, uh, and this was Cisco in, you know, 1987. Uh, and um, Sequoia invested because it got references from the early customers who had used the product and they just loved it so much that, you know, they were kind of ripping down the door of Cisco and demanding to get more and more and more of these uh, devices. Uh, and so they, so Sequoia did the deal, but it knew from the beginning that the founders were not really up to running a company that was going to scale a lot. Um, they were erratic and lost their temper and so forth. And so they, they fired the founders. Um, and that was a gutsy move, and it went down almost as a sort of an example of why entrepreneurs should hate VCs uh, for quite some time. But in terms of the investment outcome, it was genius. I mean, it certainly turned a company that was completely incapable of scaling to something that became you know, one of the dominant firms in the Valley in the 1990s. But you're right that Uber is a more recent and in a way even more interesting example because there what happened is you know, Benchmark um, was the venture capital company that backed them at the beginning. Um, it was a great investment. It went really, really well. But at a certain point, rather as with Cisco, the tough-minded founder who was completely determined to get the company off the ground was not quite the right person to run the company once it had scaled. Because Travis Kalanick, you know, had a lot of drive, um, a lot of competitive determination, but when it came to running a bigger operation where it actually you were in the public eye and you had to watch the ethics, you had to watch the legal compliance, you had to get the accounting right, you know, he just didn't want to focus on that stuff. And when uh, Bill Gurley, the benchmark investor, would tell him, look, Travis, you can innovate in lots of ways when you're doing a tech company, but don't innovate around compliance, don't innovate around legal um, you know, procedures, don't innovate around the quality of the accounting. You know, the financials have to be conservative and correct. Um, you know, the response from Travis Kalanick was basically to try to just marginalize Bill Gurley, rescind his permission to, you know, his key card, which led him into the Uber building, uh, suddenly didn't work anymore and, and, and so on. And because Travis had been given these super voting shares by the later investors, he could afford to just ignore uh, the investor. And it took Bill Gurley to be kind of basically waging guerrilla warfare, um, you know, to to get Travis out. And that involved, 
you know, building a legal case against some of what Travis was doing, building a coalition of uh, other investors who saw that you know the brand value of Uber was being deeply damaged by some of the scandals that were coming out because of Travis's behavior. So, so in the end, Travis was pushed out, and that sort of rescued Uber, uh, at least in my view, and set it up for the IPO, which would not have been possible otherwise. Well, you also talk about SoftBank, right, and Tiger Global, and even, you know, PIF, right, coming in uh, towards the end. And, you know, Yuri Milner, I think, is a character that played a big role in this whole story, right? Um, but, but you know, it seemed like Yuri Milner, at least, was someone who paid very careful attention to the, the details of, of the businesses in which he was investing. Uh, some, some of the others may have been a little more reckless with, with their investing. Um, and then you point to, I think Theranos, I mean, you talk about WeWork, but I think Theranos is, is, the, is the, the pinnacle of sort of dumb money investing. These folks were not venture capitalists at all. There, there weren't even, there weren't really that many venture capitalists that got their hands dirty with Theranos. Yeah, that's right. I mean, Theranos, um, the founder, essentially got money from people who were not of the valley or people who were kind of, you know, well past the age of 70 and had retired. Um, and so in terms of active venture capitalists, the only person um, who backed Theranos was uh, uh, was DFJ, Donaldson. No, sorry. Um, it was Tim Draper, I, was I think. Tim Draper, I'm sorry. Yeah. It was Tim Draper. And he wrote, a, he wrote a, an angel check, which was small enough that I think it basically doesn't count. There's nothing wrong if you meet a smart, driven, charismatic kid who has a big dream saying, OK, well, why don't I write a, a check? I think it was half a million dollars, which not much for a venture firm. And we'll see what happens. Um, uh, I think where the bad investments came was later when you were talking about bigger checks. And by this point, Elizabeth Holmes was claiming to actually have a blood testing product that was, was beginning to work. But of course, she had faked all the data. And if you invested at that point, you were guilty of malfeasance, of, of not asking tough questions. And we know from the very good book that's been written about Theranos' bad blood that when, um, when Elizabeth Holmes tried to raise money from real venture capitalists at that stage, she would walk out of the meeting after the sort of the fifth question because she couldn't answer the questions. Uh, and the only way she could raise money was by going to kind of amateurs, um, venture tourists, not venture capitalists. Um, so that's sort of a vindication for the professionals in the space. I think a, a more tricky one is actually FTX. You said you were teaching a class recently on crypto. Mm -hmm. uh, and there you had somebody who turned out to be, um, you know, a fraud. Um, and, you know, pending the court's verdict, that's what it looks like today. Um, and um, venture capitalists, including Sequoia, you know, poured money into that thing. Why did they do it? And I think there, you know, partly it was COVID, that the due diligence was not face to face and was a bit sloppy. Partly it was, you know, this amazing crypto boom, which made it feel incredibly risky not to be involved. And so people were willing to write checks, even understanding that they hadn't done great due diligence. Uh, and I think you can rationalize that. I mean, some people say, oh, well, that's just FOMO. It's actually a bit more subtle than that. If you are a venture capitalist and you're sitting there in 2020 or so, and you're seeing that, you know, something like half of the smartest young engineers graduating from the top programs uh, in computer science are going into crypto, you kind of need to be in touch with that flow of human talent, even if what they're doing is nonsense and it's going to crash, because you want a relationship for them with them for the next project that they do afterwards. It's just too risky to your franchise to be out of the network. We go back to our network theory discussion. And so I think there was some excuse for writing those uh, checks to FTX, um, even though this was an example of something that turned out you know, not quite as bad as Theranos, because Theranos was, you know, to do with health and people's actual health was badly affected by the fraud. Um, but still, um, you know, FTX was approaching that level of badness. Well, I remember in 2017, there were people who were saying that, 
we wouldn't need venture capital anymore because anybody could just issue a bunch of tokens right, and, and raise money for their startups. And, of course, th this seemed ridiculous to me because the tokens that were sold – right, didn't come along with any kind of advice, right? And so, um, and, and so the, the smart founders would presumably continue to seek out kind of vent, venture money. Um, of course, that didn't, didn't stop some of these, these companies from, from not getting good advice. But, but when it comes to in governance of a startup, you can lean on your VCs, but who can the VCs lean on, right? I mean, I think if you had just written the story of Kleiner Perkins versus Sequoia, I mean, that would have been a standalone book and it would have been an interesting kind of compare and contrast. And, and I think John Doerr would have been the, the, the tragic figure in, in that story. So, um, so how, I mean, if, if, the, if, the, if the governance and the organizational structure of the venture capital firm itself of the GP is going to impact its success. How can, how can they make sure that, that they get the proper oversight so that you don't wind up with, with an echo chamber? Yeah, well, I mean, to some extent, there could be oversight from the LPs who say, look, you know, if you want us to provide capital for you to invest, you know, we want you to do the following things to make sure your operation is properly run. In practice, the sort of more successful uh, GPs are not going to get that kind of pressure because they tend to be capacity constrained. In other words, they've got more money they can act they, they've got more offers of capital than they can actually accept. Because when you're doing early stage and venture, you can only write checks up to a certain size, and it's very time consuming to write too many checks because you're then supposed to go on the board and pay attention to these companies. So you each partner at a GP probably can't be on more than about seven boards. And so you do the math and you just don't want too much capital. So uh, that means that the capital providers don't have that much leverage over the established GPs. So it it's kind of becomes a self-governing thing that the GPs have to be smart enough to say, all right, we should look internally. We shouldn't just look externally at the investments we're doing in these startups. We should look internally at ourselves uh, and say, well, how do we you know, if we were on our own board, <laughs> what would be we be telling ourselves to do? And I think that's where, um, you know, Sequoia stood out, actually, in the last 20, 30 years, because they had this stewards structure, uh, where the top one or two or three people, there's been different numbers of stewards at different times, it's really their job not to do investment so much, but to invest in the actual venture company. Uh, and Mike Moritz, who was the steward for a long period between the mid-90s and around 2010, uh, would like to say, you know, in fact, I, I didn't ask him a, the right question to set him up to say this, and so he got a bit annoyed and said, you know, I think you should be asking me this, and then I can answer as follows. Um, and, and what he wanted to tell me was, look, you know, people always ask me, uh, what's my favorite investment? And they expect me to say, well, it must be your investment in Google or your investment in Yahoo or Stripe, or you know, Michael Moritz has done plenty of these things. But no, Michael Moritz's favorite investment is in Sequoia itself. It's in the time he spent sitting down with the younger partners and saying, okay, show me your calendar. I want to see how you spent your time. Um, could you have turned that meeting into a phone call? It would have been more efficient. You know, how do you think about sitting on the, the board that you've just joined? You know, what are you trying to contribute? When are you listening? When are you intervening? really coaching people um, to be the best kind of GP they can be. Uh, and I think um, not all venture partnerships are led by people who conceive their role in that way. They still think of themselves as being outward facing and doing deals in startups, whereas they th should be devoting a lot of their time to the internal. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it makes you wonder, will there ever come a day when you could kind of systematize what it is that, that the venture capitalists do, right? Um, you know, we're, you talked to, before the podcast about um, you know artificial intelligence, right, and and the the investing in that in that landscape. But I mean, a lot of people have speculated on the ability to kind of learn from what the successful VCs have done and to come up with some kind of process that was m more scientific, right, which would kind of make venture more like 
other areas of, of finance. Do, do, you, do you think that's do you think that's that's realistic? Do you think there's any chance that we could somehow create sort of a more factory like system for identifying uh, good investments and good founders and investing in them? My basic answer is no. Um, I mean, I've met people who have been, you know, working on this. Um, and, you know, one of the techniques you can use these days is you can scrape LinkedIn for leads about what, you know, certain talented engineers who are in the right company to understand a particular thing. You know, what are they doing? So let's take an example. Let's suppose you, you are keeping tabs. You write some code that will keep tabs for you on all of the machine learning engineers who are working at the top five um, ML labs. And you're watching them on LinkedIn, and if they don't post or make any noise for a bit, you think, well, what's going on with them? Maybe that's because they're in stealth and they're thinking about you know, starting a new venture. And so I should you know, go see them prospectively, not wait for them to emerge from stealth, and then I might be too late. So there are people who are thinking about this, um, but I think fundamentally the things which will not be, um, you know, cannibalized by AI are things where, A, the human-to-human -human contact is super important, and that is true of venture investing because it is about, you know, a venture capitalist, a human being meeting a startup entrepreneur. They have to agree that they're going to be partners together and that this is going to be you know, something you can't exit very easily and you're probably going to be meshed together if it goes well, you know, you'll be doing, uh, you know, you're, 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 you'll be doing a three-legged race for the next seven years. Um, so you better get on. Uh, and the other thing is that AI, in addition to being not good at human to human, AI is essentially, of course, extrapolating brilliantly from everything that's happened in the past. And to the extent that you're talking about the future, it's a bit tougher. And then I would add, to the extent that the number of observations is limited, it's tougher. I mean, you know, all of these programs work on extensive training. And to do a lot of training, you need a huge number of bits of data to train on. And venture is, doesn't, it's not like, you know, some macro hedge fund or whatever that's, or, or just the public markets generally where there are gazillions of trades every day and you get tick-by-tick tick data and really break it down. No, no, this is something with a rather small number of observations um, where the judgments that are behind each of those deals were in, the, in themselves subjective and they're not quantifiable, they haven't been written down someplace. So I don't quite see how you scrape enough data and, make, and, and, and put it into a shape um, where you can make a machine learning system work. So I, I do think that venture is a holdout in that respect. Well, what, what I find interesting is that while the, the GPs understand the, the power law and they understand the, the difficulty in, in looking for patterns in, among uh, founders, the, 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 the LPs, right, they, they oftentimes will treat uh, venture uh, as an asset class, right? And they're looking for, for characteristics like, you know, mean return and standard deviation of return. <laughs> and so they'll, you know, they'll make, they'll make an allotment uh, and uh, they'll set aside some percentage of their, their portfolio. But, but it seems like, you know, you can't do that in, in venture. I mean, there's, there's no index fund for venture. You have to go in and identify which firms you're going to invest with. And, and it seems like that problem is almost as difficult as deciding, right, which portfolio company to invest in if you're a venture capitalist. I completely agree. I mean, uh, specifically when we're talking about the early stage, the Series A, Series B stuff, I completely agree with that. I mean, what the LPs are doing is that they should be, you know, they should be looking at the GP and saying, is this an individual that I believe in. Um, and it's a qualitative bet on an individual. Now, I have this conversation with LPs quite a bit, because since my book came out, I've been, you know, asked to go and speak to lots and lots and lots of them. Um, and, you know, the conversation typically goes like this, I, I say what I just said, and then they say, Okay, so, 
how do I judge which individual, you know, I should back? And I'd say, look, there are two obvious things and then two slightly less obvious ones. The obvious things are that, you know, most of the good GPs I wrote about in my book either had, um, you know, an engineering degree or some other skill which would add value to the portfolio company, maybe be an expert in, um, you know, go-to-market strategies. Um, secondly, um, they know something about business and finance. Perhaps they have a business degree. Um, thirdly, um, they may have themselves started a, a startup or been an early employee in a, in a startup. So that experience from the inside of being an entrepreneur. Uh, and you don't need maybe all three of those things, but you probably might need two. That's the obvious thing. The less obvious thing is that you need to be what I call embedded. You need to be in a network which is going to be generating startup founders. And you need to have standing in that network. You need to have thought leadership such that the founders that emerge from this network are going to want to come to you for money because they're also going to want you as their advisor. Um, and that embeddedness is super important. And then the last thing is, you know, don't back an individual because of what I said earlier. You know, it's much more powerful uh, when you're doing very subjective judgments about early stage companies. It's much more powerful to have a team of four or five or six uh, uh, GP investors who can test each other's instincts on who to back and who not to back. So avoid the solo GPs, go for the embedded people and look for two or three of those characteristics, which are having worked at a startup, having a piece of advice that you can give either because you understand engineering, or you understand marketing or something. And then thirdly, um, understanding the basics of business and investing. Now, what, what's interesting, when, at the beginning of the book, right, all of the venture capitalists were fairly experienced people. I mean, they'd, they'd been working in finance uh, for, for a big chunk of their lives. Um, and, and I remember when I came out to California to visit my cousin in 1989 or so, he said, oh, you know, you should think about becoming a venture capitalist. And I thought, well, I'll, you know, I can't do that straight out of school. But we're seeing people go, now go straight out of school uh, into into venture capital. It's it's actually a, a, a career uh, that one can choose relatively early in in life um is is that a is that a sign is that a, is that a potential um indicator <laughs> that that the, the industry's too big um or does that is that just part of the natural evolution of of this industry i think we would find if we looked at you know which operations which gps were hiring people straight out of school is it would probably be the growth investors and the growth investors they do have a rather different you know, job that they're doing. They're not looking for the genius uh, founder who, whose genius can only be told and identified through subjective methods. You know, when you're doing growth investing, you already have a company with a product, with, with some market traction, with some earnings data. You can, you know, look at the rate of growth in that earnings data. You can project it forwards and you can do a calculation about whether this is a good growth investment. So that's a fundamentally... In other words, Excel, your Excel skills will be might actually have some value. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so I think that's where um, it's a it's a different kind of game and, and maybe hiring people straight out of college makes sense. Now, everyone, you, you, you know as well as I do that pretty much every place on earth is trying to replicate the Silicon Valley model, right? So Silicon Step, you know, Silicon Planes, you know, Silicon... <laughs> Va um, mountain, I don't know, <laughs> they're all trying to do this. But um, there really haven't been that many successful um, imitators. I mean, is that just sort of a, you know, location economies? Um, or are there some structural impediments to, uh, to replicating what, what happens in Silicon Valley? So I think that it's mostly about understanding the formula, understanding the secret source, and then having the guts to implement it um, in this sort of very risk-friendly, power law understanding manner, where you understand that eight out of 10 bets will probably go to zero or something. And you're going to make all the money from bets nine and 10, which each should be fund returners or better. Uh, and that's how you make it work. And it's just not human nature 
to lean into risk that aggressively. And the reason why there was not really any rival to Silicon Valley, at least I'd say until 2005 or so, um, that is, is because this just doesn't come naturally to people. I would go and see people who had worked in so-called venture partnerships in Boston in the 70s. And they would say things like, well, I had a great career. I did 40 investments. I didn't lose money on a single one. And of course, that's laughable if you're in Silicon Valley. Of course, you should lose money on many of them. Otherwise, you're not taking enough risk. Um, and so those so-called venture operators in Boston were not the real thing. And that's why Boston failed to rival uh, Silicon Valley as a technology cluster. My, my theory is that Around about 2005, when um, Silicon Valley VC started to branch out and move into China, uh, this secret source was bottled and exported. And it's, you, know, you do see now a lot of venture activity in New York, in Boston. Uh, Austin is you know, rising in the last few years. Um, there was a lot of hype about Miami. I don't believe that one quite so much. Uh, but there's also growth in London. Um, you know, India's had some ups and downs, but there's some going on. Israel is a massive success story. Israel actually has more venture um, per person, venture dollars per person than the US does. Um, so there's been a decent amount of success outside of Silicon Valley because I think this formula, which I describe in the book, of you know understanding the power law, understanding the importance of equity and equity options, all that stuff we talked about before, um, that formula has been understood outside the valley. Now, you're, you're working on a new book uh, about artificial intelligence. Um, there's a lot of excitement in the venture world uh, around generative AI. Um, and do, do you think that we'll continue to see most of the innovation happening w in the world of startups? Um, or do you think that we'll see a return to a period where you know, no one's going to challenge IBM, right? <laughs> At the beginning of the book, right? That was the thing. Don't even think about going into computers because IBM has it locked up. I mean, is is are we have we returned to that world where Google and, and Microsoft and, and, and Facebook, I mean, they're the ones that own the massive data sets and, and they're the ones that are ultimately going to be the, the loci of, of all the future innovation in this space? Yeah, I think that um, there's a good chance that, you know, a large share of the economics of the upside that's generated by AI will accrue to the incumbent behemoths. Um, and this is sort of contrary to the premise of my book. So I don't say this lightly, uh, because the premise of my book is that the incumbents have innovators dilemma. You know, they don't want to put out a new product which will cannibalize their existing product. And therefore, they're always shy about, you know, aggressively grabbing some new technological wave. And that makes space for the startup challengers who are more nimble, who have nothing to lose uh, and, and so on. And I think it's different for a couple of reasons this time. One is that, you know, AI, as you just said, it favors scale, scale in terms of how much data you have, scale in terms of how much compute you can afford, because these NVIDIA chips are very expensive and you have to have a lot of them. And then scale in terms of the human talent, because you need the machine learning engineers, and they are highly sought after and very expensive to hire. So that's the first reason why the incumbents have this big advantage. And then the second reason is that I think that because the innovator's dilemma has been seen to hobble the incumbents, I mean, IBM, as you said, you know, that was the classic scary giant that nobody wanted to mess with until people messed with it. And then, funnily enough, the personal computer market was stolen from right under its nose. And so I think because of IBM's humbling and because of the you know, humbling of successive you know, big um, incumbents, uh, the, today's incumbents have sort of internalized that story so much that they are willing to do stuff like Mark Zuckerberg has done, which is to completely rename his entire company, call it Meta, and bet on this Metaverse, even though the Metaverse hasn't been built and may never actually be much. I mean, it's super aggressive, super risk friendly. And I think if you look at the way that Microsoft is just pouring money into open AI and into generative AI more generally, it's an enormous bet, right? But it just speaks to that anti-complacency, the willingness to bet the farm on a, an emerging technology. And Google is, is kind of doing the same thing. You know, it's empowered uh, 
uh, Demis Asabis, the head of uh, DeepMind in London, which is a subsidiary of Google. And it's, it's taken this person in London, put him in charge of the whole AI team, including Google Brain in, in Mountain View, and said, right, you know, before we said we were an AI company, now we're really AI first. And they're putting massive resources I into fighting this fight. And so it seems to me that the, uh, the incumbents are very aggressive. They have the advantage of scale. And where you see a challenger, a startup popping up, it tends to be fairly quickly folded into the empire of an incumbent. So first one was DeepMind, which I just mentioned, that was set up in 2010, acquired by Google in 2014. Then you have OpenAI set up in 2015, but sort of quasi-acquired now by Microsoft, which has put so much money in that it, it almost owns it. And now you have Anthropic, another uh, challenger startup, which has taken large amounts of money, first from Google and now from Amazon. Uh, so the space for an independent, I think, is non-zero, right? There are other contenders like, um, you know, Cohere is one which is venture-backed, um, backed by a, a group in Canada called Radical AI uh, or Inflection AI, uh, another startup. So, so it's not that I'm saying there's no space for startups. I just think that unlike previous new platforms, whether that's the Internet, the mobile Internet, the cloud, which, where the economics were basically all captured by incumbent, I mean, sorry, insurgent startups. I think this time the, the incumbents uh, have a better shot at winning most of the profits. Well, I look forward to that book, and I also look forward to seeing whether those prophecies turn out to be true. We're in for a couple of very interesting uh, years uh, in both AI and in VC. Sebastian, thanks so much for joining me. The, the book is uh, called Power Law. It, it is one of the best books that I have read on, on venture capital, uh, particularly on the history of venture capital. But, but don't forget this one here, More Money Than God, um, fantastically written book about the hedge fund industry. And this one is, is still good, uh, The World's Banker. Thanks so much. We'll talk again soon. Greg, it was great to be with you. Thank you. Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution 